Uh, welcome everyone, hello. My name is Tim Duvall, as many of you probably know, uh, and I am here to give you a little bit of technical assistance on the Centers for International Business Education program. Sometimes it's called the Centers for International Business Education and Research program. We typically refer to it as the cyber program. Uh, and so I'm gonna give some technical assistance for that. You're free to ask question, questions, but the way to do it is to enter it into the text box at the bottom of your screen. That'll come up on an iPad that I have here, uh, and um, I will answer questions at the end. So let's get started. So these are the topics that I will cover today. I will talk about the competition and give whatever information I can give. It's not gonna be a lot. I'll talk about the competition priorities uh, and give whatever information I can give about that. It's not gonna be a lot. And then program requirements, selection criteria, and evaluation, uh, which are the typical elements of the, of the competition itself um, and of the application process. And at the end, as you'll see, I'll handle a little Q&A. So here we go, the competition. The program funding is undetermined at this time. That's because there's not yet a budget. Uh, fiscal year starts October 1st, 2017. That's fiscal year 2018 starts on October 1st, 2017. Um, so we cannot yet announce a competition schedule and we can't do that until funding is determined. Um, any announcements will be made uh, via the Federal Register. We'll also announce it on our website and through our uh, e-newsletter. Uh, if you're not currently on our uh, newsletter mailing list, send me an email uh, and I'll, and I'll uh, direct uh, your email address to the right person. Competition priorities, yet to be determined. You can see that, it's in red. Um, we don't yet have competition priorities for this particular competition. Uh, that's um, partly because we don't yet have uh, an appropriation uh, for 2018. Neither does anybody else, by the way. Uh, none of that has been done yet. Um, but once we do have uh, an appropriation, we will um, uh, start the process of establishing priorities, which involves coordinating with other uh, people in the department, um, including the, the Office of the Secretary, uh, to determine um, what the policy direction um, uh, is that they um, have in mind. However, to give you some context, especially for those of you who are new um, or prospective uh, new applicants, uh, the priorities we used in the last competition in 2014 are, are there on your screen. You could get as many as five points for each preference priority to add 10 points, a maximum of 10 points to the overall score for the application. Uh, and these are the priorities that we used and are currently in place. We are in the fourth year of this grant. We're about to enter the fourth year, I should say. On October 1st, um, we will enter the fourth year for this, uh, for this um, program from the 2014 competition. So the first preference priority that's currently in place is, uh, gives up to five points to applications that propose to collaborate with professional associations or businesses um, in, uh, in an attempt to expand ex employment opportunities for international business students. So these are things like internships, work-study opportunities, um, and those sorts of things. The second priority that's currently in place uh, gives up to five points to applications that propose significant and sustained collaborative activities with minority-serving institutions um, and or with one or more uh, community colleges. So as far as program requirements are concerned, the, the number one thing that uh, you need to uh, be putting in place now, if you haven't already done so, is an advisory council. It's required that you have an advi advisory council in place prior to the competition uh, because it must be involved in uh, developing the application, uh, designing programs perhaps. Um, these are people that you'll bounce ideas off of um, to uh, help you establish your center. Uh, so you have to have that in place. Uh, without an advisory council, we can't review the application. So there are a number of activities that are required. This is in the statute. It's very clearly expressed in the statute that there are certain required activities and certain activities that are, appro that are approved. So language training for international business students, faculty, staff, and members of the business community, this is required. This is a required activity. Um, 
engaging in international business research, uh, hence the R in the cyber, uh, when we call it a cyber, that's required. Collaboration with other institutions, with business associations, with educational agencies in the area of international business, <coughs> excuse me, are also required. Certain approved activities are overseas internship programs, <clears throat> faculty development international business, study abroad programs, outreach, summer institutes and in international business. These are all approved activities. Many of the current cybers uh, do do most, if not all of these. And then there's a cost share requirement for this program. This is a matching program. <clears throat> the statute says that in the first year of having this grant, the grantee is required to pay 10% of the total cost of the program. So if you've budgeted $100,000, the grantee in the first year would be required to kick in $10,000 of that $100,000. If the total cost, and, and in the year two, it's 30%, so then it'd be $30,000 kicked in. And then if the total cost was $100,000 and you're in the third year or any following year, uh, then it's 50%. That is, in other words, a one-to-one -one match. So whatever the federal government gives by the third year and all following years, you would have to match. The way that we've interpreted this part of the statute <clears throat> is to say that if you've already been a, a cyber and you've made it through um, a minimum of three years uh, being a cyber, um, from there on out, you're required to do a one-to-one -one match. So in other words, if you start a new year, let's say it's your 30th year doing it, um, and you start a new year because you get the grant this next time, you'll still be required to do a one-to-one -one match at that point. Um, in fact, it probably makes sense to, uh, if you can, get your institution on board with this. If you're a new grantee, it probably makes sense to try to do a one-to-one -one match right from the start. But you're not required to. You can propose uh, a, just, a, just the 10% of the total cost, um, and that will not affect your application in any detrimental way. It will not, you will not lose points for that because the statute says very clearly uh, that the grantee pays 10% of the total cost in year one, 30% of the total cost in year two, and 50% in all following years. <clears throat> so onto the selection criteria. First, is 20 points assigned to meeting the purpose of the authorizing statute. So we use um, a peer review process to review each application, uh, and then we make rec recommendations to the secretary based on that review process. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, that we assess is um, the extent to which each application um, meets the purposes of sections 611 and 612 of Title VI, Part B, of the Higher Education Act, uh, that's actually the Higher Education Opportunity Act, that's a typo, of 2008. Um, so you need to describe the objective, uh, objectives of the project, um, and you need to describe the extent to which the objectives enhance the statutory um, provisions. So in other words, when you're looking at the required activities, for example, um, your objectives need to be oriented around that. Um, uh, you, can, uh, you can add in any approved activities as part of your discussion, um, uh, but, um, but you need to make sure that you're considering um, the purpose of the authorizing statute. And you can get up to 20 points for that. Second is the, the significance of the project. In particular, the national significance of the project. The, the, the cyber centers are centers of, of excellence at the national level. Um, so there needs to be that, that uh, level of reach to your proposed um, project. Um, so you need to describe the importance or magnitude of the results or outcomes likely to be attained by the proposed project, and you need to, you need to make sure to express that at the national level. You, there will also be regional and local uh, impacts as well, or significance as well, um, and you can discuss that uh, in this section as well. Uh, but just make sure you don't overlook how your proposed project has a national reach. Third, describe the extent to which the proposed activities include a coherent, sustained program of research and development in the field, including, where appropriate, a substantial addition 
to an ongoing line of inquiry. So that's 10 points uh, for the quality, of the, pro uh, the quality of the project design. Okay, so we look at the way the project is designed um, and the peer reviewers determine the, um, the strength of it. You also need to include a management plan. You can get 10 points for this as well. Uh, this is where you explain exactly um, how you're going to do what you're proposing to do. Uh, part of what we're doing when we're assessing applications is we're assessing risk. And we want to make sure that you have a plan in place um, so that, uh, uh, and convince us um, that you can carry out the project uh, that you have. And having a strong management plan will help uh, uh, convince us. Can you do it on time? Can you do it within budget? Are there clearly defined responsibilities? Um, do, you, do you have uh, clear, coherent timelines? Um, uh, have you established milestones for accomplishing certain tasks? These are the kinds of things that the reviewers will be looking at when they're looking to assign points to the quality of the management plan. Next is the quality of the, quality of the project personnel. I keep saying quality. Have you noticed? Uh, the quality of the project personnel. Uh, this is, again, up to 10 points. Um, this is where we assess the people that you're assigning, probably in your management plan, uh, to carry out the tasks that will need to be carried out to complete the project as it's described in the application. So you'll need to, you'll need to um, uh, delineate the qualifications of um, uh, including relevant training and experience of the project director, for example. Um, any key project personnel uh, will also need to uh, delineate their qualifications um, uh, to make sure that they have what the background necessary to carry out uh, the project as described. Also, <clears throat> the extent to which the application encourages applications for employment from persons who are members of groups that have traditionally been underrepresented based on race, color, national origin, gender, age, or disability. And you'll need to describe this as well because that's an important uh, piece here. Another 10 points uh, can be assigned to adequacy of resources. Uh, you, need to, you need to explain um, that the costs are reasonable in relation to the objective design and significance of the proposed project. You need to describe the adequacy of support, including facilities, equipment, supplies, and other resources from the applicant organization. OK, so again, this is we, we are assessing risk. We want to make sure that you have what you need in place uh, to carry out this, um, the project that you're proposing. In, in general, it's a good thing to use this assessment of risk um, as a way to think through your project. Um, because, um, because, this is, because this is an important part of what we do when we, try to, when, when we determine who gets the grant, um, you need to make sure that you're convincing us that you have everything in place and everything is properly organized uh, to be able to carry out the tasks um, of the project as you describe it. And then there's the evaluation. You can get up to 20 points for this. Um, the reviewers will, will, um, uh, will carefully look at your project evaluation plan um, to determine um, uh, if you have the right elements in place to properly evaluate what it is that you're doing thereby convincing us, of course, um, that you're paying proper attention to the, to the um, programs that you're putting in place and following up with people to make sure uh, that, that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So you can get up to 20 points for that. And then um, if there are competitive preference priorities, um, right now, of course, they are business collaboration and community college and MSI co collaboration. Um, uh, but if that's the case, then there will be points assigned to that. Uh, we don't yet know um, whether there will be priorities. We don't know what they will be. We also don't know the point value at this point. All of that gets determined as part of the policy process. Um, and that policy process will get underway as soon as we have an appropriation. Now we're on to everybody's favorite topic, the performance measure form. Um, I know you're all very excited. Um, the, the performance measure form, for those of you who don't know, presents the data elements necessary to demonstrate 
uh, the project's performance. Okay? We're, we're, we're looking to assess your progress toward the achievement of your goals. Um, this is something that we put into place for the FY14 competition. So we've only been through one cycle with this. Uh, and it was an attempt uh, by us to find a way to review performance um, in a way that was both quantitative uh, and relatively straightforward for us in particular. Um, I know that a lot of work goes into this. It actually, a lot of work went into designing the, the, the PMFs. A lot of work goes into determining baselines and targets and, um, and uh, data elements and all of those things that you need to do. Um, and a lot of work goes into uh, uh, determining um, and negotiating the final uh, forms after the, after the grant has been awarded. But in the performance measure form, there are five required data elements. They're listed there, project goal, performance measures, activities, data indicators, baselines, and targets. I'll go through each of them one by one uh, uh, quickly. First, the project goal. Uh, this is a, a straightforward, clear statement of what the project is aiming to achieve or accomplish. Ideally, uh, it should be aligned with the overall scope. Each uh, project goal should be aligned with the overall scope of the project. And ideally, you should limit the project goal statement to one sentence. I'll show an example on a later slide so that you can see uh, what, what this looks like, especially for those of you who are new to the PMF process. I'm sure you'll be curious to see what one looks like. Second is the performance measure itself. Uh, this is what we use to determine if the project is meeting its overall project goal. So for that particular project goal, uh, there, there can be one to three performance measures. Um, and those measures will relate back to the project goal. And, and the whole idea, of course, will be to measure progress toward reaching the goal. So these performance measures should be specific, they should be time bound, and they should use well-defined units of measurement. They can address direct, direct products and services delivered <coughs> and or the results of those products and services. They convey not only what will be achieved, but also by how much. So a performance measure should be pretty um, direct and straightforward with, re with regard to what, uh, they, what um, you're planning to achieve with, particular, with, res with respect to that particular performance measure and also how much, that's the quantitative part of it. Third are activities. These are the actions that will be implemented in order to meet the performance measure and the project goal. Next are data indicators, which are specific observable and measurable characteristics. Um, these are used to determine whether carrying out the activity results in progress being made toward meeting the performance measure. So you can see what's happening here, right? The data indicators and the activities and the performance measures all tell us something about the project goal and the extent to which you're reaching that goal. Um, as you can see, the data indicators should reflect both the activity and the performance measure, taking into consideration the types and sources of data that will be available to best demonstrate that. And then finally, you uh, should include the frequency um, for the data indicator. Um, are, you, are you collecting it by semester, by quarter, by conference, by, you know, uh, how frequently will you be collecting the data? And then finally, you need to establish a baseline for each performance measure and a target for each performance measure. Uh, often, the project goal itself might indicate we want to increase this particular thing by this amount. We want to go from, you know, 50 to 100. Um, and then, and then each performance measure would be a part of trying to reach that goal of 50 uh, or 100, as the, case was, as, the, as the case was in the example I just made up. Um, so you need to establish what your baseline is. What do you already have in place? What is the point of reference? Uh, and then from there, um, uh, tell, uh, tell us where you're going to go each year to get to your final goal. Usually the final goal, the target, is at the very end of the, of the project, but you can hit targets along the way. Um, and uh, that, that there's a place in the form um, to do that. So you can either do it, as, as it says at the bottom there, you can either, either express it discreetly for each reporting period or it can be cumulative over the course of the performance period. 
And there's an example um, for you. So as you can see, there's a project goal statement. It is uh, expressed in one sentence. Increase the number of students graduating from X university who are proficient in business Portuguese by 10% during the grant period, period when compared to the prior four-year period. Okay, so um, then there's one performance measure, create and offer business Portuguese courses. Associated with that performance measure are two activities, recruit and hire qualified business Portuguese instructors, instructors and review and revise all language courses to ensure that a communicative-based approach is being used. Then there's data associated, one, one data indicator associated with each activity and, uh, and two associated with this performance measure. All right, so there's the number of qualified business Portuguese instruct instructors in the program associated with the first activity. And of course, that activity is associated with the performance measure. Uh, and the number and percentage of all courses in business Portuguese in which a communicative-based approach is used. That's associated with the second one, which is the second activity, which is associated with this performance measure. Uh, there's a column for, uh, how, for frequency. It's going to be collected annually from departmental records. That's the source. And the baseline is established because, of course, you can see there's already a baseline established because um, it's, uh, it's, it's trying to increase by 10% during the current grant period when compared to the prior four-year period, which is not necessarily a grant period, by the way, if you're a new grantee. So there's already six in place, um, and the idea is to try to get to 10. Um, and that's all played out. That's all uh, uh, um, played out clearly uh, in the baseline in T1, T2, T3, and T4. So at the end of target year one, there'd be an increase of one uh, and so on. So that's what a, uh, that's what a, a, a CYBE or cyber performance measure form uh, might look like. That's me. That's my contact information. Um, if we have not already corresponded, please feel free to email me or call. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can answer um, via telephone call or email. Um, uh, and um, now uh, we will move on to uh, the question and answers. We have a lot of time, and I, I know from this um, uh, group that there are likely to be a lot of questions, so uh, let me take a look and see what we have here. There are a few questions uh, that I will address um, if I have answers to them, um, which I don't, so we're done. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Um, Okay, uh, so um, the first question um, comes from Catherine Anders at um, Cal State Fullerton. Um, she says, for previous priority two, what if the lead application is an Hispanic-serving institution? Would that qualify for competitive points? It's a great question, Catherine, and the answer is yes, it would. Um, if uh, we, we, we actually have a, a couple of current grantees who are um, uh, HSIs or MSIs, uh, and um, they are able to collect the points um, uh, si simply by being one of those institutions. One of the reasons for this competitive preference priority was to try to expand the reach of the cyber program to make sure that community colleges and minority serving institutions are, are um, able to access the, the, the research and the teaching that's done by these centers. Uh, and uh, it, so that, that priority targets those schools um, and and we are um, um, uh, and so if you already are one of those schools then the cyber program is doing what it's supposed to be doing uh, so you do you are eligible for the points uh, here's another question from UCLA if you had a cyber in the past but not in the most recent cycle would the matching funds requirement revert to 10 percent in year one of the next cycle that's an excellent question um, uh, my reading of the of the statute is that um, uh, if you've if you've already completed two years uh, as a cyber, then um, then you are subject to the one to one match. Uh, however, I can um, uh, correspond with attorneys on this, uh, and I will do that um, just to make sure that that's the proper reading. Uh, so I can get back to you uh, on that, and anybody else who is interested um, in, in that. 
Next, <clears throat> once, the, once the competition is announced, once the competition is announced in the Federal Register, when, that is how soon, would the submission deadline likely be? Um, difficult to say uh, at this point. Um, typically what we like to do is we like to uh, ensure that there is a 60-day um, turnaround. That's what we'd like to do, but it depends on the timing. If you recall from last time, um, we, had to annou we announced so late because of, because of uh, uh, taking so long to get an appropriation, because of some policy issues that came up. Uh, we announced so late that we were only able to do, I think, a 30-day. Um, we like to do at least 45 and ideally 60. So if we can announce early enough, um, which is dependent on a lot of things, including an appropriation and policy progress, um, then, uh, then we would, then we would uh, ideally do a 60-day uh, deadline. Um, if, if it gets pushed much later than that, then that could change because we need to have enough time to do all of the stuff after the competition, um, which is a lot. Um, uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, to develop a slate and get it uh, um, ushered through the clearance process and approved and so on. Um, let's see, will the, will the PMFs be part of the application narrative or appendices? Uh, good question. Um, it, that, that, can be, that will not be part of the narrative. It doesn't have to take up the, page, uh, the, the pages in the narrative. Uh, instead, it can, it, it can and should be attached as an appendix. The application document itself that will be released in the Federal Register when we announce the competition uh, will clearly delineate uh, uh, these sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and it will say that the PMFs need to be in the appendix, not in the narrative. Next, if overall side funding is the same as the previous grant period, will the same number of sides be funded or, or more with less or less with more? Um, we like to try to keep the unit cost for each grant as high as possible. Um, and because this program has been cut so much since 2011, we ended up going from 33 to 17. Uh, we initially planned to go 33 to 16, um, but during the slate process, those numbers can change. Um, and they did, and we went to 17 this past time. Um, but the, uh, this just died, by the way. The, uh, the battery ran out. <clears throat> um, uh, we, we um, um, where was I? What was I talking about? I lost my train of thought. I need to look at that. I don't have it. Unit cost. Got it. I'm back, Mike. I'm back. Um, this is from Mike Sheely, by the way, at University of South Carolina. Uh, the... We, we try to keep the, thank you, we try to keep the uh, unit cost as high as possible. So if we get level funding, um, then uh, the chances are um, that we will uh, try to fund the same number, 16 or 17, something like that. But that, I can't say anything definitive, definitively on that because um, that could be something that comes out in the policy uh, process. So I can't say for sure at this point. It's not entirely up to me. Uh, I have a question about NRC grants. Uh, I have an ex uh, uh, NRC, is, apparently there's an NRC person, at, at least one on uh, right now, which is great. You're welcome. Happy to, happy to see you here again. Um, and the question is, will that hoped for 60 day application period apply for NRC grants too? Yes. Pretty much across the board, we want to give a 60 day uh, turnaround. That's, that's, our, um, that's, our, that's our plan. Next question, what is the page limit for the narrative? If you know that yet, in years past, it's been 55 pages. Um, I don't see any reason why that would change. Um, but uh, so you have 55 pages. That does not include all the various appendices, uh, CVs, uh, PMFs, uh, letters of support, uh, and these sorts of things. How many cybers do you think will be uh, uh, expect to be funded? Um, I think I already answered that. 16, 17, depending on our appropriation, if we get level funding and if 
the, uh, other, other folks in the department who I consult with on this um, agree that we should keep the unit cost as high as possible. My sense is that it's difficult to do the job that, that is required. There are a lot of required activities. There needs to be enough money available for that. Uh, here's a question. You said up to five points each for the competitive priorities. Is that correct or can you get points only for one of them? Uh, you could get no points at all for any of the competitive pre preference priorities. Whatever they are, whatever they end up being, if you decide not to address them, zero points. Um, if you address both of them and you address them well, uh, up to 10 points. So it would, so, uh, and it's five points for each. So you can't get more than five uh, for, any, for, for one um, or the other. That's not possible. I'm not sure I understood that question properly, but, um, but if I did, that's my answer. If I didn't, please follow up. Apparently, some people are enjoying my presentation skills. <laughs> right on. Uh, let me see if I answered everything. I, didn't, I expected more questions, people. We still have 18 minutes and 10 seconds. More questions? And I don't, I think I've answered, I think I've answered them all. Um, I would love to display my presentation skills more, but um, apparently we're all out of questions. I'm shocked and amazed, uh, and I think we'll, we will end early. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, session in that virtual space out there, uh, and I'll hope to um, talk to as many of you um, uh, as need my help uh, anytime in the near future.